Hello, everyone. Sarah, take it away. Um, good evening. My name is Sarah Heim. I'm a nurse, a nurse practitioner in the state of Michigan, and I will be your moderator this evening. This evening, we will be talking about heart health. We have Dr. Michael McKee, Dr. Chad Diaz-Tadiki, and um, Nurse Bethany Baker. Um, the Deaf Health Talk are a virtual community health education for deaf and hard of hearing members. They will be hosted on Zoom. We will no longer be doing this on Facebook anymore. So um, we will have a, a link in the chat where you can sign up for the Deaf Health Talks in the future. This is made possible through the efforts of many people and organizations, including the University of Michigan Department of Family Medicine and Disability Program, Michigan Deaf Health Partners in Deaf Health, Michigan American Interpreter Services. This event is going to be captioned and we have ASL interpreting. We will have a question and answer session at the end of this talk. You, you can feel free to ask any questions that you would like. I would like to pass this off to our first speaker. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sarah. So I'm excited to talk with this group tonight. We're gonna to talk about heart health, heart attacks, heart disease, which really impact many people. There are misunderstandings about heart disease and it is one of the number one killers. COVID, cancer, they still don't compete with heart disease as a number one killer in the United States. So I want to talk about our heart, what it does, and the anatomy of the heart. Let's talk about its structure. The heart is vital. It's a pump that sustains life. So that pump, that beating, is the focal point of the circulatory system. It's actually quite small. It's about the size of your fist, it's not that big. But it's a very efficient organ and it has a vital role for our health. So there are four main parts to the heart in two cross sections. And it circulates the blood that feeds the body, that provides the oxygen to the vital organs and other parts of the body. All the blood enters the heart through the right atrium and then flows down into the right ventricle, which is, that's the bottom muscle where the pumping actually happens. From here, it connects to the lungs. And what the lungs do is they supply the blood with oxygen. So when you breathe, oxygen gets pulled in and then gets attached to blood cells. When the blood's going past the lungs, the, lung, the blood's a little bit blue, which means it's deprived of oxygen at that time. And as you breathe, the lungs saturate the blood with oxygen. And then the blood gets pumped back into the heart via the left atrium. And then flows down into the left ventricle. And the left ventricle is really the strongest muscle because that's the sque squeeze that pushes the blood out throughout the rest of the body. And it also pushes blood out that feeds the heart. Lots of people don't realize that the heart needs oxygenated blood to keep functioning. There are lots of small arteries that surround the heart muscle and they feed the heart with oxygenated blood. 
to help it keep pumping. So the heart, just like any other organ, requires blood, or requires oxygen to function well. So what happens with heart disease is that those arteries are like little pipes and blood should flow easily through those pipes as it circulates. But sometimes they get constricted. Sometimes fat can build up in there. They can become hard. Sometimes things can get clogged in those little arteries. And so just, and the blood flow gets restricted. And so less blood is feeding the muscle. And when not enough blood feeds the muscle over time, that heart muscle or that muscle dies. And that's what leads to a heart attack. So if you think of the heart as a pump, if the heart becomes too weak, it doesn't work well. And that is what's known as heart failure. The medical terminology is CHF, congestive heart failure. People can still live, but they might be more limited. They can't walk far distances. They can't lift heavy things. You'll notice leg swelling. Sometimes they have really labored breathing. And we'll have a story to kind of help you picture that a little bit later. And I'm also gonna talk a little bit more about how to talk about this with your doctor. But now I wanna hand it over to BB Tate Baker. Hello, thank you so much. So I'm BB. I'm a, I have a Bachelor of uh, Science Nursing and I'm an RN, which um, means that I have my degree in nursing and I'm also a licensed registered nurse in Florida. I work in Jacksonville in the hospital that's Memorial Hospital. I work in the emergency room. And so I see lots of different heart issues, heart disease, heart arrest, cardiac arrest, so I'll show you a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about the symptoms and how they vary between men and women. So you're aware of whether you're having cardiac arrest or a heart attack. So similar things between men and women are chest pain. Women experience chest pain, it feels like pressure more than pain. It feels like somebody's standing on their chest, they say. Dizziness is something, with, especially when they stand up or sometimes even when they're sitting. Rapid heart rate, it doesn't feel normal. It doesn't beat at a normal pace. It goes very fast or it can go up and down. So short of breath is another shortness of breath, back, neck, jaw, and arm pain, usually in the left arm because the heart is closer to the left arm. Specifically for men, symptoms are left arm pain, usually, cold sweat, stomach aches, um, digestive issues. Women-specific um, symptoms are a feeling of fatigue, sleep schedule being really thrown off, back pain, usually between the shoulder blades, right down the middle. That's where people feel like there's a dull pain. It's not a sharp pain. Sometimes people feel nausea um, and feel vom they would vomit. Women report that as well. Women would say that they don't feel well, which can cause anxiety. So it's tough for women to identify heart attacks because the fact is that women experience with their monthly cycle, they get cramps and muscle pain that feels similar to a heart attack. So they experience that every month. And so it's easy to overlook and just kind of try to get through it. While men feel like the, the tightness in the chest makes them go and talk to the doctor or maybe go to the ER faster. So interesting, right? So those are some of the different symptoms that you would see with having a heart attack. So sometimes it can be misunderstood and people will think it's a panic attack. So I'll tell you how you can tell the difference. A heart attack 
usually has pain in the chest that goes down into the back or into the left arm. A panic attack just stays in the chest area. It feels really tight just in that one area. So sometimes people go to the ER with a panic attack. And so if you're having any pest chest pain at all, it doesn't matter, you should go because you never know what's happening. It's always good to get it checked out. So panic attacks tend to go away in a few minutes, maybe even an hour, whereas a heart attack can go on, the symptoms go on for a long time. Heart attacks are caused sometimes by physical activity, uh, exertion, stress, Panic attacks can happen even when you're happen at rest, even when you're not doing anything, they can come on kind of unexpectedly. Well, heart attacks can happen with a couple of things. Maybe if you're not eating right, you're not exercising or right or enough, you could have genetic reasons. And with panic attacks, it can happen anytime. So those are the, some of the differences to be aware of in the difference between a heart attack and a panic attack. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Shadiki. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. I'm Shazia Siddiqui. And I'm here to talk about a little bit of my personal experience about my father and a heart attack that he had. So I use work at the University of Rochester Medical Center. Um, I'm a scientist and I've been doing research. Um, and this experience was when I was maybe nine and 19, it was happened in 1988. My father had just turned 43 years old and we had gone with my family to some friend's house to have dinner. And after we got back home, a couple hours afterwards, my father said he was feeling sick he was feeling nauseous, he vomited. And so we thought, well, maybe it was just indigestion. And then a couple of hours later, he was still not feeling well. So we went to the hospital and the doctors kind of looked him over and said, yes, we think it's probably indigestion. And they just gave him some Maalox to try and relieve those symptoms. But my father said it still didn't feel right and he still wasn't feeling okay. So they took him in and they did an EKG and found out that he had actually had a very severe heart attack. And he didn't realize, but they didn't realize the severity of it. So for, fortunately, my father kind of pushed them. And so like Bibi said, you know, sometimes the symptoms can vary. And my father didn't feel the chest pain that sometimes is a symptom. He just felt some discomfort kind of in this area, but he felt nauseous and he was throwing up and he thought maybe he had food poisoning. But then as it went along and it kept going on, they figured out what it was. And so he went on and he went through heart cardiac rehab and he got better with medications and some exercise. And he did have what's called a balloon angioplasty. So they go in and they use a, a balloon to try and go through the block. So there's some part of the heart that was damaged, uh, which meant it didn't get enough blood flow at that time because of the block. So it was a left ventricle that was damaged a little bit. So they tried to go in with the balloon to open that block up so that the flow of the blood would be better. So once that opened up at the time, they didn't have what's called a stent, which is what they would use now. So what they would do is go in and put the stent in and that would stay, but at the time they would just go in and inflate the balloon to open it up and then pull that back out. So he went to the cardiac rehab clinic for a year, got better, was taking blood pressure medication, and he seemed to be getting better and better. And nobody, really knew exactly what was going on with the heart attack, but probably because he had high blood pressure, could have been a high salt diet. Um, my family is from Pakistan and people from Southeast Asia tend to have higher risks for heart attack in general. But my family, my dad was the first one to have a heart attack. And then his brother also had one. 
20 years after his heart attack, he managed everything very well and he was doing very well. And so he was considered in heart failure, be, heart failure because he had a little bit of damage to the heart from the heart attack. So he walked every day for an hour. He ate, he made a huge change in his diet. The whole family changed the diet, our diets. We followed more of a, a high vegetable diet, low fat, low salt, low sugar. We had less processed food and less fried food. And this was in the 1980s, 1990s. And there was a man called Dean Ornish, and it was a diet that he had written. And so we followed that. Research now shows that a Mediterranean diet is a good diet to follow. So in that span of 20 years, he was doing well. And then in 2008, he started to have some fluid on his lungs. Mike was talking about how the blood goes through the heart and so if it gets blocked, it backs up and goes into the lungs, which causes fluid in the lungs, which leads to shortness of breath. So he had those symptoms and he went to the hospital. They drained the fluid from his lungs and they checked for edema on his feet, swelling on his legs and his feet. And so they would press on his feet and his ankles to see if he had extra fluid there. And they would check his weight. If his weight went up, every day, they would know that he had maybe too much fluid. He took a diuretic um, to get rid of some of the fluid. And then he also had a drainage tube to help with the fluid buildup. So he was on Lasix, which is a diuretic. He was on that for a long time. And then the doctor referred him to, the, to get a coronary artery bypass graft. So at that was 2008 and they used a uh, robotic uh, surgery called Da Vinci. And so the internal mammary artery, so they actually took the vein, the artery, sorry, to go around to help with the blood flow, but it didn't work well for him. And so they really had to watch, he had to watch his sodium intake. He had to also watch his potassium and sodium levels. And so he was in and out of the ICU very often, but he's a fighter. And so he was, he did okay. So he would watch the sodium levels and he knew that he had to get those down a little bit further. His cardiologist referred him to a heart center and they said he needed a heart transplant because his heart was so weak. There's different levels of congestive heart failure and he was at the last stage. So they put him on an aortic pump just to give his heart a rest so it didn't have to work so hard. And then later, his body just got weaker and weaker. His kidneys became weak, his liver became weak, and they realized that he actually needed to get something called an LVAD, which is a left ventricle assistive device. So it's kind of like a pump that helps the heart circulate the blood. So it's put in near the left ventricle and the machine pumps and pulls the blood through and helps the blood go through and flow through the body. And so he was hooked up to a machine. There's a battery that pack that he had to wear. So if you do get a heart transplant, your body has to be ready. And so your liver and your kidneys have to be healthy. And so you have to make sure that the blood flow is getting to all of the organs, including the brain. And he started to get better and better. And there was a whole team that worked with him. Our family worked with him, our doctors, family doctors, and his whole team worked together. The LVAD is considered a bridge to get to a heart transplant. So it took four years. And in 2013, he got his heart transplant. It was a very long surgery, about 12 hours long. So it was a slow recovery process, but he went through a great cardiac rehab team and he had a wonderful life for another seven years. He was still on medication. He had to take a immunosuppressant after his heart transplant. 
He had a cholesterol medication, blood pressure medication, and he started to get a little bit of uh, diabetes. And so he, he had to go on medication for that as well. So I'm very, very grateful for modern medicine and the technology that's available. So from 1988 until 2020, we got 32 more years to see the progress and the experience of heart disease and the things that were there for him. Sadly, he passed away in 2020 for other reasons from an accidental fall, but I'm still very grateful that we got another 32 years with my father. So thank you. And now I'm gonna turn it back over to Mike. Wow, thank you for sharing your story, Dr. Siddiqui. You know, sometimes people think, I'm in my 40s, I don't have to worry about any of this stuff. But it's important to realize that there are many different risk factors. One is age. As you get older, your risk goes up. She may have heard about that. But also, as she mentioned, you a Dornish diet is also helpful. There's also vegetarian and vegan. And that's shown to be beneficial in improving one's risk. So if you eat junk food, you frequent fast food restaurants, a lot of processed foods, which tend to be bought from the store ready to eat. It's not really a healthy diet. So I wanna encourage you all to think about your diet. What kinds of food are you eating? Where can you add more whole foods? Where can you start making moods from scratch? Eating more fruits and vegetables. How can you add more grains to your diet? and not have so many processed, ready-made microwave meals. Blood pressure is another risk factor. High blood pressure definitely impacts the heart and can lead to heart disease as well. So it's important to regularly get your blood pressure checked and monitor that. Some people have no idea it's, they've neither, never had it checked before, but you know, even a store often has those blood pressure machines. And I know that BB is gonna demonstrate with a home blood pressure machine this evening. So if you don't know your blood pressure, ask your doctor and make sure to bring that up or go to a, your local store and use the blood pressure machine and take note of what that number is. If your numbers are higher than 140 over 90, with the 140 being the top number and 90 being the bottom number, that's considered high blood pressure. Now, it can be affected by nerves and by overexertion. Those things can cause your blood pressure number to go up. But if you notice that your numbers are consistently high, consistently 140 over 90, that's something to go talk with your doctor about to see how they can help you manage that. If it's 138 over 88, you're thinking, well, that's not 140 over 90, I'll be okay. It's still not that great. The goal is 120 over 80 or less. So if you're in the 130s, kind of in the middle of that, that's medium high, me, you know, moderately high blood pressure, over 140 is high blood pressure. And so we would call that pre-hypertension. And that's really when the warning signs start to arise. You're not ready for medications necessarily, but you can start making changes to your diet, start to eat less foods that are really salty. Also, if you notice you're gaining weight, that's another risk for heart disease. So it's important to try to get back to a thinner body shape. 
and eating healthier foods will help you get you there. Exercise is also beneficial because remember, the heart is a muscle. It's circulating the blood through your system. So you need exercise that keeps the heart healthy and lean. You don't want the heart to become thicker and weaker. Simple things like walking, maybe lifting some light weights, biking, different activities are beneficial in that regard. You don't even need to exercise every day, but walking in the store, walking to work, all of those physical activities are beneficial. Uh, other factors can be drug use, smoking, heavy alcohol use. Those are all risk factors that increase your risk for heart disease. So if you're smoking, quit smoking. If you're using drugs, stop. If you have heavy alcohol use, either reduce how much you drink or stop altogether. Dr. Siddiqui also explained that diabetes can be a factor, which we'll get to later. But pre-diabetic and diabetic people also have a higher risk of getting heart disease because that affects your weight. Often people who are diabetic have the same risk factors because of what leads to diabetes. So those same factors that put you at a higher risk for diabetes put you at a higher risk for heart disease. Many people think that it's a generational thing as the number one reason for heart disease, but that's not the case. It's really more our daily habits and behaviors. Are we sedentary? Are, is our diet poor? Sometimes we can have a strong genetic factor. Like Dr. Siddiqui mentioned, her father and their family having a higher predisposition for it. If someone in your family had a heart attack at a young age, that's something to bring up and have a discussion about with your doctor. So parents, siblings, it's important to get with your family to collect your family history so you can bring that up with your doctor. And maybe your doctor will do some testing, draw some blood. You know, if you're noticing that you are having less energy and more fatigue than usual, if you don't know about your family history, you might wait longer than you should before bringing this up and getting it addressed with your doctor. So it's important to ask those questions with your family and learn about your family history. So I wanna talk about the patients who come and see me in my clinic who have heart disease. The goal is to make sure, my goal is to make sure that their blood pressure is stabilized, which usually means a blood pressure controlling medication. One, two, three, even four different medications can be necessary to make sure that blood pressure is adequately controlled because you don't want to make your heart work harder than it has to. Also, Dr. Siddiqui mentioned that her father was taking a cholesterol medication. And there's a class of medications called statins. And maybe you'll see a commercial on TV right now for Lipitor. Lipitor can really be beneficial in managing blood pressure and reducing a person's risk for heart disease. It also is a good medication for controlling heart disease. Uh, they used to give cholesterol medications like just to bring down cholesterol, which is important, yes, but doctors have also used it, use it to calculate your risk factors. If you haven't developed any issues, heart disease, you haven't had a heart attack yet, but your cholesterol maybe is slightly up, a doctor might recommend putting you on a medication early because it's a calculated move based on your gender, your age, potential high blood pressure, 
whether or not you have diabetes, if you're on other medications, they'll take lab results. And by calculating with all of those factors and numbers, they'll be able to predict your risk of developing heart disease over the next 10 years. So it's important to have that conversation. And if that predictive factor puts you in a, in a risk group, they might recommend starting that medication. So if your risk over the next 10 years is 10% or higher, right? You have a 10% chance, right? One in 10 people will develop heart disease. At that threshold, they'll usually make the call to put you on a cholesterol medication. And that medication also helps to reduce, let me go back. Do you remember I was talking about how the blood vessels can become constricted and those pipes can get clogged? that medication can help reduce kind of what's happening in the blood vessels and thin it back out again so the blood can move through them better. So lab results are important and listen to your doctor's recommendations. It's important for you to have a dialogue, ask the doctor why they're making those choices, but see what your risk factors are and what the predictive percentage is. Now, you may have heard that people have been told to stop taking aspirin. And that might be confusing because aspirin used to be a very beneficial medication that people were prescribed. You know, but we have fewer people who smoke now and we've got other medications that can manage heart disease better. So the benefits that people were receiving from aspirin aren't as strong anymore. What people didn't realize is that aspirin also increases the risk of bleeding. So if you were to hit your head by accident, you could have increased bleeding or in bowel movements, you could notice blood in your stool. And so aspirin was causing a higher bleeding factor. So when you weigh the pros and cons of the medication, they realize you taking aspirin without the history of heart disease, aspirin actually has no benefit. Now, if you had a heart attack or have had a history of heart disease or heart failure, aspirin is still a valuable medication to have. So it's important to share with your doctor not only the medications that they're prescribing, but anything that you get over the counter, such as aspirin, any vitamin supplements, all of those things are important to share with your doctor and have on the list of medications and supplements that you're taking. So blood pressure, blood pressure medication, again, is very important. Taking your blood pressure medication helps reduce your blood pressure on average by five points. So if you were averaging 140, it would bring it down to 135. While that seems like a small decrease, just five points, your risk of developing heart disease goes down 10% which is substantial. So doctors tend to start with cholesterol medication and then blood pressure medication. And there are many types of those that they can prescribe. So while doctors can prescribe medications, the number one way to manage and prevent heart disease is actually things that you can do. Eat more healthy, do exercise, develop behaviors or stop other behaviors that put you at higher risk, like drug use, smoking, and heavy alcohol use. Do these things to protect your heart. Because as Dr. Siddiqui mentioned, when you get to a heart transplant, it's a very intense process. You don't want to get there. 
Think of it as you only have one heart and you need to take good care of it. All right, I'm gonna hand it back over to BB. Great, thank you, Dr. McKee. So I want to add a few more things uh, before I go on with my uh, things, my other things I want to talk about. So with diabetes, problems tend to show up um, in the feet, which means you have some vascular issues. And that goes back to relating to your heart. So if you have problems with your diabetes and then your feet, it'll affect your heart later. So everything has kind of a, a effect. So heart, how are hearts tested to make sure that things are okay and nothing's wrong? So when people come into the emergency room with chest pain or they have a history of heart disease or they've had a heart transplant or they have high levels of anxiety, they have drug use, any of those reasons, what we tend to do is what's called an EKG, which is an electrocardiogram, which is shortened to EKG. And that's where they put the stickers and that what's called leads on your body for about 10 seconds. And that's the paper that you see printed out, which shows your heart rhythm. So it can identify any issues and then we can make a treatment from there. The other thing that we do is a heart stress test. It doesn't mean that we make you stressed out. It means that we make your body move so that we wanna see how your heart works. And so that stress test can vary. It depends on the hospital and it depends on the patient, but most of the time it's done on a treadmill and the person is walking on the treadmill with all of the monitors on to see how the heart is functioning while they're exercising. Make sure their blood pressure is okay and there's no other problems. People who can't walk on a treadmill or are older have something called a non-stress test, uh, but it does the same thing to the heart and it, it that does the heart, uh, the goal is the same and it makes the heart work hard and it wants to see if the heart can handle that or not. So, there's a cardiac monitor. And so again, that's something that's put on. And then there's a TV screen that is connected to um, the leads and it's at the nursing station. And it can, I can go back and see what was happening. If you're sleeping and you were having heart issues, why is that? Or if you're talking and if you're resting, but it still shows up that the heart was working hard, it can help us figure out what to do and how to treat you better. So another thing I would like to keep, if, have you keep in mind, even if you forget everything else, which I hope you don't, but be honest with your doctor, be honest with your nurse. We're not here to judge you. We're not here to um, make you feel bad. I wanna help you. I wanna make sure that you're healthy and you're safe. So be honest with us because there are things, if you don't tell us, can actually cause problems with your health. So for example, there's a medication that's called adenosine. And that helps to speed up your heart if there's some heart issues. So, but if you use cocaine and I were to give you that medication, it would actually make your heart stop. And you don't want that, right? So I had that situation with a man who was only 27 years old who didn't tell me the truth that he was using cocaine. And I gave him that medication and his heart stopped. Fortunately, um, we were able to get him back, but he had to be intubated. He was only 27 years old and we had to do all kinds of lab work and everything. And that's when we realized that he was a cocaine user. I wish he had told me I could have helped him in a better way. So something to keep in mind and be honest with your doctor. So if people have chest pain, like Dr. McKee had just mentioned a couple of things about aspirin, make sure if you are taking aspirin that the nurse knows how much you're taking. So. That's one thing. The other thing that people can give you is something called nitroglyceride, or you might see it called nitro. And it's a very tiny pill and it's put under your tongue and let it, it dissolves under your tongue. They give it to you five minutes apart. And then if you call 911, it's important that you do that. And then they'll take you into the hospital. But one of the side effects of nitroglycerin is that it gives you a headache. So that's usually the biggest thing. So 
If you think it might be related to the heart attack, it's actually not. It's probably from the nitroglycerin. Another medication that we do is called atropine, which I rarely use because it causes your heart to speed up. Um, so what's just called bradycardia. So we, we gave that to you if you have bradycardia, which is a slowing of the heart. So if you, your heart is stopped or if it's in crisis, you get a EpiPen, you know, people use it for re allergic reactions, but they'll do the same thing to help to dilate the arteries. And so it's called a vasodilator, which means it actually opens up the blood vessels. And so the blood can circulate better. And so it, it works quickly, kind of wakes your heart up if your heart stops. So that's given if the, um, the shocks don't, don't work, then they'll give you epi in order to wake up your heart. So Levofad is one of the, it's the brand name, but it's called a non-efferin. So, but we usually call it Levo. So that's a vasoconstrictor, which actually will close down the arteries a little bit. So it'll make the blood stay in that area so that it doesn't have to go through your whole system and take so long. So it'll bring everything back up, which means your blood pressure will go up. And so the nurse has to look and see what your blood pressure is and make sure that your heart is functioning right and make sure your blood pressure is okay. So the next thing is kind of interesting. People know that men and women have different symptoms but what about different races? So people talk about online things, but it's not always true. So it's always good to stand back and take a look at things. So I'm a white woman, but I'll explain a little bit. Another person um, might be able to explain a little bit better. People who are black or of different race can have heart issues more than uh, people from Caucasian background but it's not because of genetics or culture, it's because of access to healthcare. So doctors who are supportive, doctors who educate them on how to take care of their health and their heart usually tends to be much less compared to people with uh, Caucasian, people who are Caucasian. So insurance statistics show that there's a lot of uh, disparity. So sometimes statistics are not accurate, um, it can be more due to social differences rather than genetic differences. So that's something to keep in mind. So now I wanna talk about blood pressure and why that's important. So that's a measure of how your heart is working, how your heart is pumping and constricting like what Dr. McKee was just talking about. So I'm gonna show you a demonstration to see what it looks like. So if you have blood pressure on either side and it's 30 points different on either the systolic, which is the one on the top or diastolic, which is the number on the bottom. So if there's 30 points or more different between the two blood pressures on either arm, there means there's something wrong and it could be a clot and they'll send you to the ER. So if it's close, that's fine. But if they're very far off one from the other, then there's something wrong. So I'm gonna show you what it looks like. So this is my blood pressure machine. This is a digital machine. I do have a manual one, but it's not very death friendly. So I use this one. So you have to be sitting and relaxed. If you're up and moving around or chatting or on the computer or on your phone, it'll mess up your number. So you wanna be calm and relaxed and then you'll get a good blood, good blood pressure reading. So what you do, so some cuffs have an arrow as to, so you know where to put it, but some don't. So you have to follow this line for this lead. So it should be above your elbow. You should pull your shirt up. So it's, it's best if it's done directly on the skin. So, and then you can see if you have two fingers there that you can fit under the cuff that works so your blood pressure doesn't read too high. 
And then I just push the button to turn it on. Sorry, I have to look at this. Okay, so now I just sit and relax. Okay, now I'm done. I'm going to take the cuff off. So I'm a little bit nervous. So my blood pressure is a little bit high. So here it is. So the top is 138, which is a, it's close to 130. So it's a little bit high or 140. So it's a little bit high. The 772 on the bottom is good. This number 105 is my heart rate because I'm a little bit nervous, which is fine. So in a perfect world, a perfect blood pressure would be 120 over 80. That's considered perfect, but we don't live in a perfect world, right? So 120 over 80 is rare. If it's a little bit above, that's okay. <clears throat> it's important to just talk with your doctor, follow up, make sure you have appointments so they can keep track of it. So if you're noticing that something doesn't feel right, when you have the cuff on, don't just stand up, wait for five minutes and then try it on the other arm again. So the fact is, if your blood pressure is on your leg, it will be higher than it is on your arm. So we avoid taking it on the leg. So I had a patient before who was in a motorcycle accident and it had casts on both arms. So I couldn't do a blood pressure there. So I put it on his leg and blood pressure was really high for him. So, and his mom was so worried because it was so high. And I said, nope, I had to explain to her, that's actually normal because it was taken on the leg. So it's just something to keep in mind. So a couple medical terms that I want you to keep in mind, um, things that have Latin roots. So tachy means fast. So tachycardia means your heart is beating really quickly. Brady means slow. So bradycardia means a slow heartbeat. So I wanna tell you about a little bit of an experience. So, so we had a person arrive with cardiac arrest whose face was very purple. What would that mean? So his heart did stop but where would his clot be above the heart? And that's what would cause the face to be purple. So the survival rate is very low for somebody who has a clot above the heart. Unfortunately, that man passed away. If you have blue um, hands, it's called cy cytotysis, and the hands or the fingers become blue, it means your clot is actually below the heart level. There's a higher survival rate with people who have those clots, we can bring you back. But somebody who has a clot above the heart means that the hot, the brain is getting less oxygen. And unfortunately, that leads to some problems. So how do you avoid heart disease or cardiac arrest? So like Dr. McKee mentioned, exercise, eat better, avoid salt, Cardio exercise, like running or walking, walk your dog, that's fine. Chase your kids around, that's fine. 30 minutes every day and then you'll be good. You don't have to be an athlete in order to keep your heart in good shape. It's just important to be moving and exercise regularly and then you'll be fine and you'll keep your heart healthy. So before I close out, I wanna give you a couple of interesting terms that I wanna tell you. So dextrocardia, which is not something I've seen yet, but it means the heart is not on the left side of the chest, it's more to the right side. It's considered a birth defect, but it's interesting. I haven't seen it, 
So all of the organs are shifted into the opposite side of the body, which is interesting. So I don't know who's supposed to be go next, but I will turn it over to the, our next presenter. Thank you for sharing all of those different terms and your experiences as well. Okay, we do have a few questions that have come through, so we're gonna go ahead and handle them as a group. It says, they were wondering about aspirin. Should they use it regularly when atrial fibrillation pops up? They already weren't able to address that, right, with the shocks. So they are wondering to shock it back into regular rhythm. And also we're given a pacemaker. So it depends if a person is very old, uh, if they will, or if they're a fall risk. So, and I call it atrial fibrillation AFib. So I'm just gonna refer to it as AFib from here on out. There are many different medications that we can give. So what that is specifically, this it's a set of blood thinners. And the, what we're trying to avoid is a clot. As the heart is pumping, blood should be circulating, circulating freely throughout the body. But if it gets, if as the heart beats, it will skip beat or it'll hold for a minute. And so what the, happens is, is that the muscles or the blood will kind of hold for a minute and that blood can get thicker and then that could lead to a clot. So it's quite dangerous. So the medication reduces the risk of that. Or there's a newer medication we have, um, Xeralto or Eliquis are familiar names. There was an older medication you may have heard of called Warfarin and Coumadin. We don't use those quite as often anymore. So if a person's at higher risks of falling or extra complications, we don't really wanna prescribe those medications and we might give them aspirin instead. But please, it's important to talk with your doctor because there are some deaf patients who come to me and they have a history of AFib and they've been on aspirin. And that's not as effective at preventing AFib as blood thinner. You know, it depends on if they're at a high risk for developing clots later as well. So that's something your doctor and you should have a conversation about. There are many medications. So it depends on your situation for which one the doctor's gonna use. Oh, Dr. Siddiqui, yeah. I've also seen many hospitals have preventative cardiology clinics. So if you think you have some risk factors, in particular, go to the preventative cardiology clinic and find out how much you can do to prevent a heart attack for yourself in the future. Like Dr. Miss Key said, you only have one heart. You've got to keep it you know, in good shape so that it works for you for the rest of your life. So really take care of your heart, you know, take care of your body. And if you feel like you have a higher risk, go to that preventative cardiology clinic and get seen. And the fact is that 30% of deaf people, only 30% of deaf people regularly go to their family doctor. So problems can come up. So usually if something serious comes up, they go to the emergency room, but you could fix things before if you go to your family physician regularly. So people are asking about the brand of blood pressure medic, uh, blood pressure machine I was using. And it, I just want to say that it doesn't matter, but the one that I'm using is Omron. I did some research and some reviews, and this one had the most reviews, positive ratings. So are they 100% accurate? No, none of them are. But this machine is better than the one that you've seen maybe in some nurse's offices where they just put on the wrist. A machine like this is a better one, but really the best way to get it measured is something called manually, which is what doctors usually do, or they have machines at the hospital. In the emergency department, um, they'll check your blood pressure there, and that's the most accurate. But the machines work very well, especially if your heart, your blood pressure is really high. They can help you monitor 
If it starts to go up a little bit, you can keep an eye on it. And if it goes up, you can go see your doctor. Yeah, excellent advice. A question came in regarding high blood pressure and how do you manage high blood pressure? I notice people wait, they put it off, you know, and when the doctor says, let's start you on this medication, a lot of patients will refuse it. And really that's putting your life at risk. You're at a bigger risk for heart attack and heart disease uh, and high blood pressure. So don't ignore it. That's the most important thing to mention. Medications are helpful, yes, but that's not the only way to manage high blood pressure. Again, exercise regimen, eating healthy, losing weight, avoiding heavy alcohol use, quitting smoking, all of those things can reduce your risk for high blood pressure. So focus on things that you can do to help prevent the problem as well. But delaying treatment for high blood pressure is not good. It's important to follow your doctor's recommendations. So again, get to a healthy weight, you know, and if you get on the medication, you can talk to your doctor about when you reach a good point, maybe stopping medication. You're not necessarily stuck on any medications. And diet's a big Low factor. Low diet. Yes. Yeah. And a lot of sodium is hidden in a lot of those processes. Yeah. McDonald's is not good. So one of the things um, that we all support is preventative care. So deaf population tends to lack, uh, fall behind in preventative care. So we're doing these different talks in order to increase people's awareness of preventative care so that there's less issues. So that's our goal with these health talks. And we hope that's what we've done tonight. So something that we can supplement to help with uh, heart health. Some doctors like one thing and some doctors like another. So there's a lot of different factors to go into a decision about what medication or what supplements or which kind of treatments that you would need. So if you're watching advertisements on TV about specific medications, you know, there's a lot of countries that ban that. U.S. is one of the few places that allows those kind of advertisements. But it's so it's kind of hard to know. But have good, healthy foods, fruits and vegetables and smoothies and walk with your dog and exercise and low sodium and all of those things are so much better than sitting down and doing Netflix and chill. So you have to have a balance and make sure that you keep things active. And some people think that supplements will realize is that they don't interact well with each other. So it's important to tell your doctors which supplements you're taking because that can affect medications that they prescribe to. So it's really important to have the interaction known. And some supplements can actually build up and cause vascular issues. So you could have, you know, could cause more problems than it helps. So also be careful where they come from. Things that come from China are some, are, could be issues. Um, some from the US can be okay. So do some research um, and talk with your doctor as opposed to believing everything you see on Google. I wanna wrap this up with an important topic. There was a study done in Chicago where they surveyed deaf people. And unfortunately, many deaf people were unaware of symptoms of a heart attack. And that's a really scary thing, you know, and again, like I mentioned, you know, a lot of people in the deaf community delay care. They didn't call 911 when they started to feel it, they led, which led to further complications and eventually death. So it's really good to learn this now and share this information with your friends. I mean, this program is going to get recorded. Share it on Facebook, share it in your feed, you know, watch it another day, you know, continue to refresh yourself. But let's spread awareness and educate our community you know, and know that if something feels wrong, ask for help right away and get yourself to the emergency department. It's never too late to start making improvements to your life. It's never too late to start working on preventative measures. Let's not get to the point where we have to fix it. Exercise, eat healthy. These are so beneficial. You know, protect your heart, protect your kidneys, your brain. I mean, really, it protects your whole system. It really benefits you. So yeah, last, that, last question here said, how does physical activity help with your heart? And how can I put that into my busy daily life? And I get it, I'm busy too, I'm a nurse. 
I'm a, I teach workshops. I have a family. I have friends. So I get it. It's tough. So 30 minutes every day, cardio, it can be anything. It could be folding laundry while you're just walking around on the treadmill or walking your dog, play with your kids, swimming, just important to be moving just so that you get your heart going a little bit more and you're breathing a little bit harder. So because you're making your heart work a little bit harder. So you don't have to do CrossFit or join the Olympics, just a little bit to get you warm. You don't have to be really sweaty, just a little bit, and then we'll be happy. And I always thought that walking is the best, honestly. Yeah, just it's the get easiest out one. there, go for a walk. And also the point is to get your blood flowing, right? Getting your heart pumping it throughout your body. When I went through my dad and going through cardiac rehab, I mean, he had to start from scratch. And the first thing was meditation learning how to breathe and slowly build up his endurance and then get into walking, right? So there's all these little things you can do every day. And if you just walk for a little bit through the day, it adds up. And really these things add to a longer life. And one of the interesting things is that sex is also considered cardio. <laughs> so there it go. does, there's research that shows you have better health if you have sex on a regular basis. So just throwing that out there. Yep, this is Dr. McKee. Thank you, everybody, for watching tonight. Uh, we will announce the next Deaf Health Talk soon. I think we're going to schedule out in June. So once we work that out, we'll share that with everybody. And from now on, we won't be doing Facebook Live anymore. We're going to be doing these talks solely on Zoom. So watch for the link. Please join us. And uh, that we're just going to avoid some technical issues now by using the single platform. Zoom's going to work much more smoothly for us. And also, we can utilize the resources, share slides, things like that. So, I'd like to thank our panelists. Thank you, BB. Thank you, thank Dr. You for Sabine, having me. for joining us tonight. Thank you to our interpreters. Thank you, Bettina. Thank you for our captioners as well. And the whole team, Sanjana, I appreciate that. And then Pavani, thank you for all of your help. And I hope to be here next time. Thank you oh, for yeah, having me. Glad to have you come back. All right. Have thanks a good everybody. night, everyone.